Committee will come to order. Thank you for waiting. The uh, vagaries of business on Capitol Hill is that we are always subject to the activities on the floor of the House. And so we just completed business for the day. Uh, I note that Attorney General Swanson uh, is going to have to leave at 5, so you'll be permitted to leave at 5 p.m. in order to accommodate your flight back to uh, Minnesota. And at 5 o'clock, you, you may leave. That's, uh, you know, we're grateful for your presence there, and uh, the committee will be in touch with you regarding this matter. Appreciate that you're here. Thank you, uh, Madam Attorney General. Thank you. Mr. Kelly, uh, you're required by California statute, California Code of Civil Procedure, Section 1281.96, to publish the results of all your California consumer arbitrations. But the subcommittee's investigation reveals that you don't publish the results of all of your California arbitrations involving consumers, you only publish the results of some of them. For example, you administered 2,331 California arbitrations filed against consumers by Columbia Credit Services, but you haven't published the results of any of those arbitrations. The explanation your representative gave our staff is that while California requires reporting of consumer arbitrations, it does not define the term consumer arbitrations. Mr. Kelly, tell me, is there any way at all in which an arbitration filed by Columbia to collect on a consumer debt assigned by MBNA Bank is any less a consumer arbitration than, than an arbitration filed by worldwide asset purchasing to collect on a consumer debt assigned by MBNA Bank. Chairman Kucinich, the circumstances you're describing is accurate. There is no definition in the statute. So you take a very hazardous course if you make a determination one way or another. What we did in that circumstance is we relied on the filers to indicate what's a consumer case and what's not a consumer case. We didn't make an independent judgment, review the facts of the case, and frankly, that in and of itself could argue against the neutrality of the process. So we left it alone. If the filer is designated as consumer, it was designated as a consumer. I will point out that even some of our most vocal opponents have indicated on the record that our filing in California is far superior and far more complete to many of the other providers of, our, of neutral services. And we can provide that specific reference if you, if you so choose. Well, I, I, I have to uh, say respectfully that what you're saying uh, defies credibility because contrary to your representative's explanations to us, in fact, Mr. Kelly, California does define the term consumer arbitrations. This is a quote from Section 2, the definition section of uh, the California Ethics Standards for Neutral Arbitrators in Contractual Arbitration. I'm going to put up the document. Uh, it's a pretty quick read, but uh, what they do is they basically uh, define consumer arbitration. And, uh, and it's a pretty succinct definition. Now, isn't it really true that all of the Columbia claims are consumer arbitrations? Mr. Chairman. That's under the that, California Act. I, I have to admit I'm not intimately familiar with the California law and the statutes there. Thankfully, the representative who you're referring to is here today. If you might give me a moment. The, I'm I can, sorry, that what? The representative of our, uh, of our organization that you're referring to is here today. 
I do, could. Do, do you want to confer with somebody? Yes, so if I may. We're giving him a copy. We're, we're going to give you, we're, what we're going to do, I'm going to ask staff to provide you with a definition of the, uh, of consumer arbitration. I'd like you to look at it a moment. And we'll, we'll wait. Yes, sir. Thank you. Just take your time. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yeah, the gentleman uh, may proceed. I started off by uh, asking you a question so we can uh, frame this properly. What I said is that contrary to your representative's explanation to us, California does define the term consumer arbitration. We've just given you a copy of the, t of the definition. And I began to quote from Section 2, but since you've read it, I don't need to do that, and without objection, Section 2 is going to be included in the record of this hearing. Uh, now, again, Mr. Kelly, isn't it true that all of the Columbia claims are consumer arbitrations under this California definition? Under this definition? Uh, I couldn't tell you. This is the first time I've seen this definition. Well, let, me, I, let me just say, the, this the contract, Mr. Chairman, here, is not, in, is bear not with the me, definition I, at issue. Bear with me on this. The contract is with a consumer party as defined in the standards. Isn't that right? Isn't it, isn't it right? I'm not following you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry. The, co the contract that we're talking about here is with a consumer party, right? Which contract are you referring to? These are consumer arbitrations. The contract's with a consumer party, right? I haven't looked at these specific In the Columbia cases. Case, are you familiar with the Columbia case? Uh, I'm cases, aware. The Columbia cases. You're familiar with the Columbia cases? I'm aware that Columbia cases are at issue in the San Francisco uh, law. So we're going back to the definition of consumer arbitration in California, which is where we're focused here. The contract is with a consumer party in, this, in the Columbia case. The contract in which the debt is incurred is with a consumer party, correct? I would disagree if what you're talking about is the reporting statute. The definition that you've presented here is not a definition in this statute. I mean, it, it is inappropriate to take a random definition of consumer in some this unrelated is, this statute. This is right from the California ethics standards for neutral arbitrators and contractual arbitration. But it is now, not. You, you can't, you know, you can argue with me. You can't argue with those words. This is right from that. We didn't make that up. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, and I completely are, are agree you, with you on that Are you currently being prosecuted for violations of this statute? We are, we are under in suit in San Francisco, yes. So I think it's clear that, that NAF is, is violating California law, but, but why? Well, that's an issue in the lawsuit, and we would strongly disagree with it. I, 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 and I'm not sure I'm making my point clear, You're, Well, the but this is not the reporting statute the subcommittee staff Francisco obtained case. the case files of 48 NAF arbitrations filed by Columbia. And those files show that Columbia routinely asked arbitrators to add attorney's fees of 33 percent, despite the fact that the controlling Delaware statute places an upper limit of 20 percent on attorney's fees. In most of these cases, Columbia received attorney's fees that violated Delaware law. Now, isn't it true that your failure to publish the results of your California, of your Columbia arbitrations in California assists Columbia in concealing its violation of Dela Delaware law? Chairman Kucinich, uh, we can certainly provide you the information necessary to respond to that. I can't, can't tell you here today what the facts are or what the arbitrators decided in those cases. Frankly, that's a matter of law. 
and, and Columbia, not an issue that I'm prepared to qualify here one way or, or another. Well, we're going we're gonna to take your explanation. We're going to move on. Columbia is not, but, but uh, I think that since we have other members of the committee who have not uh, been able to come back for this second round, uh, the committee is going to submit uh, this question in writing and give you the opportunity to answer uh, succinctly uh, and with some detail in, in writing. So we can, I, I want to move to that, make sure we send a letter to uh, Mr. We would Kelly. appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for the confusion. Well, we're not confused about this. I, you know, Columbia is not the only collection company whose California arbitration results you do not publish in violation of California law. Your representative informed our staff that there are others. Do you know whether or not those other collection companies are also asking for and obtaining awards of attorney fees that violate Delaware laws? As we sit here, Mr. Chairman, I don't have personal knowledge. We're going to send you a, a, a written request, and we're going to ask you to provide the committee with a list of companies whose uh, California cases you have not published. And we appreciate your cooperation with, uh, with this subcommittee. You'll have the cooperation. Yeah, because I, I, just, uh, I just, you know, we, we just had that discussion. Now, um, Mr. Kelly, let's look at, uh, for a minute, I want to look at one reason why consumers Uh, we're going to, you know, I'm waiting for any of, uh, anybody from your side who wants to come. I'll be glad to yield to them. Uh, I'm going to go to a third round now. Uh, Mr. Kelly, let's look for a minute at one reason why consumers may not have appeared at one of your consumer arbitrations. In all of the claim files that the NAF produced to our subcommittee staff, the only evidence that the consumer knew about the arbitration was a form statement by the creditor's attorney that the respondent was, quote, served with the initial documents required by Rule 6, unquote, and that, quote, service conforms to the requirements of Rule 6 and applicable law, unquote. There is no evidence of who actually performed the service, who was served or the documents were served. Now, in each and every one of these cases, the NAF has absolutely no idea who actually received the service. Isn't that right? In response to that, I will say that our rules provide for service in a number of manners. And the rule is pretty clear on this. Certified mail can be delivered personally. Proof of that service must be provided in order for the case to proceed. The rules are consistent with those, as I understand it, in the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. I will note that in most small claims court, all that needs to be done is regular mail. Well, well, Our need, procedures are far more You need an affidavit, but, but isn't it true that there's no return receipt showing the signature of who actually received the documents? Isn't that right? I, I would disagree with that. I, there's I, a return receipt? In, in the cases, I, I certainly can't speak for every case in the system, but by and large, we get, by, if there's certified mail, we by and large do get uh, a, a return receipt as far as I know. Now, obviously, we need to go back and we need to look at the specific cases you're referring to because I'm, I'm not familiar with now, those am, specific cases. Am I correct that it's NAF's position? that the adequacy of service is an issue for the arbitrator and the arbitrator alone to decide. Uh, that is correct. Well, I want to see how this works in context. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask staff to hand uh, to Mr. Kelly uh, a complaint by Mr. Benjamin Guzman, who was a respondent in an arbitration handled by the NAF. He states that he never received any notice of arbitration and that the person alleged to have received the notice was his landlord for whom Mr. Guzman was not on speaking terms at the time. The NAF's official response, written by your staff counsel, Mr. Ryan Chandley, was that the creditor filing the claim required a proof of service and that, quote, the decision about the adequacy of service in this case would be decided by the arbitrator hearing the case. I just want to, you know, I want you to walk through this with me. 
got the creditor filing the claim, serves Mr. Guzman's landlord, files a proof of service saying that the creditor served Mr. Guzman. Mr. Guzman, no notice of the claim because his landlord didn't tell him about it. Mr. Guzman does not appear at the hearing because he doesn't know about it. The arbitrator didn't know that Mr. Guzman was not served because the proof of service says Mr. Guzman was served. So, Mr. Kelly, how can the arbitrator make a decision about adequacy of service? He or she can't. Can, can they? Doesn't it, they don't have any time. They don't have any true information. The only information an arbitrator has is that Mr. Guzman actually was served. So when the NAF responds that, quote, the decision about the adequacy of service would be decided by the arbitrator hearing the case, can you see how that would seem disingenuous? Mr. Chairman, if Mr. Guzman was not properly served, that is a defense that he can raise in the arbitration, a defense that he should raise with the arbitrator. That uh, is a matter he know how of to law. Do, how does he, he okay, let's, okay, let's stop right there. You know, these hearings don't have to be that formal. He doesn't know, get it? He doesn't, he doesn't even know about it. Went to his landlord, he isn't talking to him. So run the so, string So up. how do you assert your rights if you don't even know that you were, you were cast into some proceeding? So let's run the string we, out then. If, help, if me, help me with this. I, I, I'm interested Eventually, in Eventually, presumably, now, I, Mr. Shanley's here and I can ask him about this specific case, but let's just run the logical string out on that. So Mr. Guzman doesn't know that he's been, he's been sued, right? Okay. Which, by the way, the Boston Globe talks about routinely in small claims and conciliation court because their only mail is required, not certified mail. We're talking, we're talking arbitration, NAF So let me get back. So then Mr. Guzman at some point presum presumably learns the judgment has been entered against him, correct? How'd that happen? I, I assume that some, I, I don't know, but I'm just, I'm speaking of a hypothetical now because I'm this specific case, Mr. So you're Jan saying at some point he's going to find out a judgment was entered against him, but the judgment occurs, one would assume, principally because he wasn't even in court in, in this arbitration setting to defend himself. His opportunities are to reopen the case, to move to vacate the award, to move to amend. How often, he also does, that, has how often does that happen? He also has an opportunity at the court hearing in district court when that arbitration award is going to be enforced to at that point move to set aside the Does that happen board. very often? And, and if, people, if people don't know enough to negotiate an arbitration, how, how are they going to know or have the resources to negotiate a court uh, appeal? Well, I, I, it isn't a court appeal. All it is is a hearing to confirm the arbitration award. But that, I mean, then you get into your fundamental policy issue, Mr. Chairman. Well, let me ask you, you were talking about you know, what, what he can do. Mm -hmm. How much time does Mr. Guzman have to s set this uh, decision aside? I need to consult on that, if I may. How much? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. I, I, I yield myself such time as I may consume here. I'm sorry, what was that? No, I, I was just committee formality saying we're going to continue. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I reiterate that you know, I, I don't claim to be an expert in this area of law. I'm advised by the staff council that you, that you spoke with that the time is generally 90 days, but there are exceptional circumstances which can be considered under the rules. And if the creditor doesn't file within 90 days and waits, what happens then to Mr. Guzman? Uh, then it would fall under, the exceptional, under those exceptional circumstances I previously mentioned. Mr. Bland, would you like to comment on this? There's actually 
uh, it, it's a dis distressing thing about our court system right now, but there's actually a circuit split, as I understand it, among the different federal circuits and also among the state courts about what happens if the, if the arbitration award's entered and the consumer has 90 days under the Federal Arbitration Act and under most, the vast majority of the state arbitration acts. If they don't move to vacate the judgment within the 90 days, for example, because they don't know about it, there are a number of courts which have actually said that they can't then come in and challenge any aspect of the award, even in service. I mean, there, there's some courts that have this terrible catch-22. Now, there are more courts sort of on the consumer side of this, but that, that actually has happened a number of times in courts in America where even identity theft victims who can prove that it was never their credit card or whatever uh, have an have a, uh, arbitration award entered against them, don't find out about it till after the 90 days, and then when there's a confirmation proceeding, then? they can't defend. I mean, it, it, it differs from court to court, but there are after, a lot of okay, courts uh, you know, they can't Try to defend. help answer the question that I asked Mr. Kelly. What happens after 90 days? It, it depends on what part of the country you're in, but in a lot of parts of the country, you're nailed down and stuck with it, even if, even if you've never got notice. I mean, it depends. There are parts of the country where you can defend against the confirmation in court if you've got a lawyer, but there are, there are actually a lot of parts of the country where that sticks. It's, it's you know, incredibly you me, unfair. You heard me lay out the case of Mr. Of the Guz, Mr. Benjamin Guzman. Yes, sir. How many, how many Benjamin Guzmans are out there, do you think? Well, there, there are tons. In, in, our, in my testimony at pages 18 to 20, we set out a whole bunch of examples of instances where there, are, where there are terrible service of process, and then we gave you a list of nine or ten consumer lawyers who, not just us, it's not just, I'm not the only person in the world who says that there are a whole bunch of people who have come into my office and said, I never got service. You know, um, I, I did a case in the NAF that was a nursing home collections case where um, uh, our client was in her 90s and she had Alzheimer's, and they served the house of one of her daughters where she had lived like four addresses before. I mean, it was incredibly ridiculous service, and then they enter a award of $20,000. $20, do you have any idea of how many uh, people Thousands. have had Thousands. arbitration awards issued against them without ever receiving notice the arbitration was going to occur? It's, it's going to be in the thousands. I mean, it's, it's, it would be impossible to give you an exact number, but it's going to be... Mr. It, Kelly, do you have a response to that? Is, that? is that possible, that there could be thousands of people out there who have arbitration awards issued against them without ever receiving notice that an arbitration was going to occur? I, I, I couldn't begin to answer that. Okay. I, I want to uh, ask uh, you, Mr. Kelly, about the relationship with the uh, accretive alleged in Minnesota's attorney uh, general's suit. And, um, you know, I, I, I just um, – hold on a minute. Yeah, I, I know you've settled this case, but if I'm asking any questions that may bring some new things and you're not sure, uh, you do have a right not to testify. You'd have to assert it. Uh, you knew at or about the time of the reorganization of the NAF in which the Agora funds set up by accretive acquired a 40% ownership interest in your company that Accretive was acquiring or had acquired the three largest U.S. debt collection firms, uh, speaking of Man Bracken, Wolpoff and Abramson, and Escanos and Adler. And you knew that uh, that relationship had to be concealed in order to maintain the appearance that the NAF was an impartial body with no ties to the debt collection industry. I want to show you a slide in which you clearly state your intent to conceal the true nature of your financial relationships. Put that slide up, okay? Do you got a <clears throat> staff? And we're going to give you a copy so you know exactly what we're talking about. Is this, is this it right now? Where is it? Yeah, this is a memo from, from you uh, to uh, Madhu uh, Tadakanda, dated Monday, November 20th, 2006. And the relevant uh, part of this memo, uh, Madhu, 
I look forward to working with you too. And then you go on to say, we remain deeply concerned about walling any deal off, any deal from Man Bracken. The shared ownership issue concerns us on many levels. Go on to say in uh, enumerated paragraph number three, that uh, in parentheses, no public information concerning accretive with the fund that ultimately acquires and holds a minority interest in the forum. And then in, the, uh, uh, in, in a later paragraph, you state, I cannot overstate our concern over the man bracken relationship, although I do not have any solutions off the top of my head. And this is highlighted. We should certainly plan for unwinding any deal in the event shared ownership becomes an acute issue. Now, uh, if, if the public knew about the true nature of NAF's financial relationships to the largest debt collection companies in the country, do you think anyone would believe that the NAF was f fair or independent or, or uncompromised? Well, let's be, very, let's be very clear about the structure here because I think there's some things in there that can be grossly misleading. Let me just say this. We'll, we'll clarify. This, this is it. accurate. I will clarify. This is obviously accurate, and I did have these concerns. So let's, then I say in here, I want to put some additional thinking around the structural issues. So we did. I want to point out that there is no ownership. It's not, it, you, but you're saying you did, but is, that's not really reflected in this memo, is it? No, because there are subsequent. Obviously, this was, this was the, one of the very first memos in our transactional discussions. So as we go through this, you're saying that you, you have other documentation you could provide to this committee that you were trying to get to what point? We can certainly provide more information, but I can walk you through what was done. It's actually, there's, there's nothing particularly unusual or sinister about it. The first point is that the ownership of the National Arbitration Forum never changed. There is no corporate ownership in the National Arbitration Forum. The same individuals own that entity that always owned that entity. Some of the assets of the National Arbitration Forum were conveyed to an entity, Forthright, which I'm now the CEO of. Forthright, not the National Arbitration Forum, did accept outside investors. A minority. That's, so the first point that's important to note. Were they involved in debt collection? Were they involved in debt collection? Well, let's let's qualify that. So that forty percent, that forty percent, was then sold to approximately seventeen. There are approximately seventeen funds, not one, seventeen that were part of Agora. Roughly seventeen. We can find you the specific number and provide that. Were you involved in of helping those to 17, put this deal together? Excuse me. Of those seventeen, one fund was accretive, all right? So one seventeenth of those funds was accretive that held a minority interest of 40% in an entity that was not the National Arbitration Forum, but that serviced the National Arbitration Forum. Well, how did you end Forum. up with, how did, how did? Then? How, no, how did you end up with accretive then if, if, if 16 out of 17 was not involved, then how did accretive come in and how did they just so happen to be a debt collection company? Well, no, all those funds participated. Agora includes roughly 17 diverse funds, which include the endowment funds of four major universities, for example. We can provide you with that information. But Accretive is just one of those 17 funds in the 40%. Are you saying it's just coincidence that you, that, you had, uh, uh, that you had a partnership here with a debt collection company? No, there was no partnership with a debt collection company. Accretive, which is one of the 17 funds that bought 40% of the servicing company, also has an investment in a company Did that you know that? Services. Was that a surprise to you, that they were involved in debt collection? We were aware. I, I'm not sure we were aware at the time. I believe we were aware at the time that they had an investment. Well, which, well you must which have keep known in mind, something. In private, that, equity, in private you, equity, it is not uncommon for private equity funds to have hundreds, in fact, well, thousands understand, of portfolio I understand that, but you know, what's, you know what's interesting about this memo is that well, you could have mentioned hundreds of different entities. You mentioned Man Bracken. Well, this is the one. The other ones didn't cause any concern. This was the one that caused concern, and we went to great lengths to protect and, and build in. So you're saying you made systems. you made every effort not to have a, uh, any relationship with debt collection companies. Is that your testimony? I, I would say that's right. I would say that we we put we did a lot of structural things in order to create Chinese walls and wall off that small fund. Uh, 
from the entity, in including after we did the split, we had a whole segregation team together, which weighed all the practices, separated everything from databases and phone lines, went through it. I did not but sit on that how segregation How do you explain this team. memo, though? Help me. We what had the largest on? law firm Mr. in Cowley? Minneapolis review and do a full legal okay. audit on the process. But you're here right now, and, I, I just, and I've got your memo, and I've got your words. Correct. And I see you mentioned Manbracken, which was, a, um, uh, was about to be acquired by a creative big debt collection firm. You mentioned in your memo that you were concerned about walling off, uh, walling any deal off, any deal from Manbracken. Okay, we know what that means. Then you mentioned uh, you cannot overstate your concern about the Manbracken relationship. Uh, and that you say that in the parentheses, no public information connecting accretive with the fund that ultimately acquires and holds a minority interest in the form. Now, if, you know, and anybody reads that, it's a fair reading that you were just trying to keep this a secret. I mean, what, what, was, your, what was going on in your mind? Why, why, were, you, why were you afraid of that? Actually, for, for competitive reasons, frankly, my concern was that uh, we would have a difficult time marketing to uh, other businesses and other entities. That because, was my concern. Play this out. Why? Because there was this particular investment, which is why we protected against it fully. To ensure that when we do make it public, we're able to say we have these protections in place and this is why it's fair, um, which is in fact what we did. What happens to the $42 million In fact, it, is, it was public before this. I mean, it, we were required to make these disclosures in a number of states. This is not something that is, um, frankly, we didn't think that there was an issue with it, to be honest, and we still don't. Well, well then what happens to the $42 million that the Agora funds invested in Forthright and the NAF? What happens to that money? The money that's invested in Agora? Mm -hmm. uh, the money Agora invested into Forthright? That, that the Agora funds invested in Forthright. What happens to that? Uh, uh, well, they invested in Forthright and the NAF. What happens to the $42 million? Are you asking where that $42 what million is? What happens to it? The $42 million, uh, by and large, was distributed to the shareholders. Forty-two million distributed to the shareholders. Uh, who, who are the shareholders? The shareholders of Forthright include NAF Inc., um, the Agora Funds, and there's a management pool in there as well. And who are, and uh, are there any other shareholder interests here that we're talking about that you're aware of? Uh, not that I'm aware, but that we can provide that information to you. That you can provide. I would like you to provide to the committee all the shareholders uh, receiving any, any of the distribution? We'd be happy to do that. that. The information was freely provided to the Attorney General as well. be happy to provide that. Okay. Now, um, in, uh, in Ms. Swanson's testimony, um, it was stated that the Small Business Administration was instrumental in the creation of the arbitration debt collection conglomerate that she brought charges against and stymied her investigation into the NAF. Um, just if you could help me here, Mr. Kelly, can you think of any legitimate justification for using money from the Small Business Administration to finance the creation of Axiant? which joined together uh, the three largest debt collection companies in the United States? I, I, Mr. Chairman, I, I can't answer that question because I have no, you'd have to, you have to answer, that, that question would have to be answered okay. by Axiant or someone else. But, I can tell you that the SBA is not a participant in the Agora Fund. There is no SBA money in the Agora Fund. Did you have any communications with any representatives of the SBA? in connection with their response to the investigation of the Minnesota Attorney General? I, I in fact, have never had any interaction that I'm aware of with the SBA, and, and neither has anyone from Forthright. Anybody in your company that uh, was directed to have contact 
with the SBA? No. If you no. didn't? Did, no. Do you know anybody who, in your company who has? No, and I, again, as I said, I wouldn't imagine there ever would be because the anybody, SBA anybody is not in NA, invested in Has anyone in NAF, Inc. had any contact with the SBA? In no, there's no, investment, the, there's no investment by the SBA there. Let, let me, I think I can just clarify this. I mean, I don't mean to be confrontational. I don't, I don't well, intend to be. We're out of the business. Can I tell you, we, you know, I'm not a confrontational person. But, so. but I, I will say, I think there, you, you may misunderstand the SBA investment. I, I, trust me, I hesitate to speak for the Attorney General. But as I understand it, the SBA investment is in a fund other than, other than Agora. It, it's, in a, it's in another investment. Com that, that investment is, is, as far as I know, Unrelated to unconnected to accent in any way. It, it it may be, but that's the question I can't answer. So you're saying the as far as the structure of it, you're not familiar. Yeah, it's not in our. But that structure. you but that you never had any uh, connection with uh, uh, or meetings with any representatives of the SBA, and no one connected with you in any of your uh, capacities had any communication with the SBA about the uh, in investigative matter. Uh, at the uh, Minnesota Attorney General's office. That is correct, sir. Uh, I think that we've covered most of the territory that we can cover today. I just, uh, we've had a number of witnesses here sit here while Mr. Kelly's had to do most of the work. Uh, do, do, is there anything you'd like to say uh, in conclusion? You want to make any final statements before we wrap this up? Uh, Professor, do you want to say anything? I mean, I don't think I have anything to add from my opening statement, which is I mean, the most important thing to me, it, thinks, it seems to me, is if we're evaluating arbitration as a process, we can't do it in isolation, that we need to compare it to the alternatives. And, and I sort of urge the committee to keep that and sort of take that into account. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bland? Um, Congressman, I, th I think you've got the big picture here totally. If I could make one suggestion with respect to the California disclosure issues, I think that from the um, cases that have come into us and complaints we've gotten from California consumers and from contacts we've gotten from a bunch of California lawyers, that the disclosures that have been made leave out, apparently on purpose, two really important things. California was trying to figure out not just who won the case and how many cases were brought by certain companies, but they were trying to figure out if the arbitration fees were big in particular cases. And they were trying to figure out, secondly, whether there was a lot of attorney's fees being added in, because there are limits under the debt collection laws about the amount of attorney's fees that can be added in. And what's happened in a bunch of cases that um, we've seen from consumers and other California consumer lawyers have seen is that uh, a company, a debt collector, will bring a claim, say, for $5,000. Then they have a $1,000 claim for attorney's fees and a $1,000 claim for arbitration fees. And what gets to, and then and they get it they get it all from the arbitrator. And what shows up on the internet in their disclosures is claim of seven thousand dollars, award seven thousand dollars, attorneys fees zero, arbitration fees zero. And so it gets bundled in so that the answer a consumer gets, they get the impression that there's no arbitration fees, they get the impression that there's no attorney's fees, and that's the whole point of the statute asking the question is to get an honest answer to that. And I think that if the committee does going to ask some written questions, I, I, I urge you to probe that because we have gotten a lot of consumers complaining to us that they feel like the information that they've seen um, up there is not accurate. Why? Well, <clears throat> uh, your point's well taken. And there are needs to be a sorting out of the various fees so we clearly understand which ones are being bundled in and described as uh, being one thing when in fact they're the other. It's a point well taken and in our follow-up questioning we'll, we'll do that. Uh, Mr. Neymar. Only thank you for the opportunity to participate. We have no further comment. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kelly, you've been here a long time. You've uh, uh, been a uh, a very busy witness, and is there anything that you'd like to say before we wrap this hearing up? No, Chairman Kucinich, thank you for your time. And obviously, if there's any additional documents, we'd be happy to provide it as we have in the past. Well, I know that uh, this has uh, certainly been a difficult time for NAF, and you know, occasionally institutions in our society proceed in a way that uh, sometimes uh, they get the legal system at another point takes a different view of it, and then everything changes. And obviously, things are happening like that for NAF. Um, what we're trying to do with this committee is to 
is to look at how these practices in arbitration affect consumers with these mass debt collections. And if you put yourself in a position of a consumer who may not be getting proper information and may not really know what's going on, it's going to be a very tough time for a lot of people. And then you get the issue of financial literacy, which is all together a different issue which another committee takes up. So this subcommittee is going to continue to be involved in this. We'll continue to um, send you some uh, in inquiries that we'd appreciate your cooperation in helping us uh, find out what we can do to try to make this system work better for consumers. Uh, certainly with your experience, you're probably going to be someone who is in a position to tell us uh, uh, what can be done to make the system better. And so we appreciate you taking this time. I want to thank each and every one of the witnesses here for their participation. And, uh, and uh, I'm Dennis Kucinich, Chairman of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee. Uh, t today's hearing has uh, dealt uh, in, uh, with the issue of arbitration and, um, and, and the misuse of mandatory arbitration to collect consumer debts. Uh, this uh, committee stands adjourned. Put all this stuff together and take it back from the